What do you think of that? And are you concerned that we're moving, as we seem to be, toward war with Russia? So what's the total number of Americans murdered by Russia in the last three years? I'm thinking I'm not great at math. I think it's around zero in that range. But the problem is nobody pushed back on the fundamental terms. Like, wait a second. You know, is there evidence for this? Do you know this to be true? Don't Americans have an inherent, which is to say a right they were born with, an inherent right to make their own decisions about how they live on the most basic level, what medicine they put in their body, where they travel? Nobody said that. The media never presented that as an option. You saw this in the war in Ukraine. It began, and the first thing you knew, I mean, you could have like divergent opinions, I guess, about which weapon systems to send. But you were told at the very beginning that, you know, Russia was our enemy. One thing we know about this is that one side is bad and one side is virtuous. And, you know, I think a lot of decent people would reach that conclusion independently. I'm not contesting that. I think it's completely fair to think Russia's bad and Ukraine's good. But it's also within bounds to not agree with that. Because if you're an American, you have the right to decide who you hate, okay? That is a fundamental right. No one is allowed to force you to be mad at somebody else. If you're an adult, you get to decide. And you get to decide on the basis of whatever criteria you want. And it's totally fair to say, well, I don't know. I'm not mad at that person. You're not a criminal for thinking that. It's not a criminal act not to hate somebody. So it's totally fair to say, well, wait a second. You know, it's not an expression of love for Russia to say they, they haven't killed any Americans. Why is that crazy? That's true. I said to one of the candidates yesterday, I mean, look, I've never been to Russia. I'm not that interested in ever going. I don't speak Russian. I'm born in this country, kind of probably plan to die here. Hope to. But let's just do the body count. I don't know any. I do know two people well personally who've died from fentanyl that was manufactured in Mexico and allowed by the Mexican government to come here. Now, I'm not against Mexico. I grew up right next to it. I kind of like Mexico, actually. But the Mexican government allows that. And over 100,000 Americans die every year from that poison. Not because they were drug addicts who took too much, but because they were poisoned. Because they were taking a pill they thought was something else, and it turned out to be fentanyl, manufactured in Mexico and allowed by the Mexican government to come here. And so that's 100,000 a year. That's hundreds of thousands of Americans dead, mostly young people, or more. So if you had a country that allowed hundreds of thousands of your fellow citizens to die at, say, age 23, and I'm sure every person in this room knows someone or knows someone who knows someone who's died. It's not some abstract epidemic. It's so big that everybody knows somebody. So on the question of Russia, if you begin the conversation with this is an evil country that has hurt America and we have to go to war with them, well, then there's kind of no debate about it, is there? I mean, no one would defend Nazi Germany. They killed many tens of thousands of Americans. You can't, can't defend them. No decent person would defend that. But in the case of modern Russia, you're not even allowed to think that. And once you're prevented from thinking something, you are completely controlled. I mean, in my life, I just try to stay unaffected by the propaganda. That's like the main goal of my life every morning just to stay unaffected, just to look around and try to assess things cold. What are we looking at here? Now, you don't have to be a genius to do that at all. It doesn't even, I don't, I'm not a genius, that's for sure. But just look out and like, what does this look like? Drive across America for three hours. Is this what you remember from five years ago? Does it look better or worse? Are there more people sleeping on the street? Is it dirtier? Is there graffiti? Graffiti? Oh, graffiti. What is graffiti? That's not art, it's vandalism. And when it's allowed to stand, what does it say? We've given up, we don't care. We're allowing people who create nothing to destroy what we built and we're not fighting back. Graffiti is like one step from total society collapse, period. What you're saying when you allow graffiti is we have no self-respect at all. We don't care enough about our civilization to keep it clean, to keep it pretty. Previous generations worked their whole lives, gave everything they had just to like put in sidewalks just to put in gas lines, just to build concrete buildings, and we're letting someone who's never done anything of value for our society 
destroy it with vandalism. And we don't have a problem with that. No, it's not a big deal. It's just graffiti. They're graffiti artists. No, this is a sign of the collapse of civilization, period. But you're not allowed to think that. So if you allow propagandists to set the terms, and if you're playing soccer against somebody and he's like, here, totally fair match, we're evenly matched. The thing is that when I score a goal, it counts, and when you do, it doesn't. Totally fair. Let's just agree to that. Probably not gonna win. But yesterday, I sat and watched, and I kept my temper the entire time, because it's not up to me who the Republican nominee is at all. I'm just an unemployed talk show host, so I thought, I'm gonna try to keep myself out of it. But I raised the question, it was a completely fair question, there are clergy in Ukraine who are being thrown in prison. Convents raided, nuns kicked out, priests handcuffed, thrown in jail. So, I mean, on one level you think, well, it's not my country. You know, they do all kinds of barbaric things around the world. You can't be upset about all of them. I'm much more interested in what's happening in El Paso than I am in Kiev. On the other hand, if I'm paying for it, and if I'm sitting here listening to moral lectures about how I have to pay for it, or else I'm a tool of Putin, I think it's fair to ask, like, what is that? Throwing priests in jail? What do you think, as someone who's spent his life advocating for religious freedom, about raiding nunneries and throwing priests in jail? And he said with a straight face, well, they, you know, they had the wrong views. Oh. Oh, so, oh, that, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't realize what the boundaries were. So you have religious freedom or freedom of speech or freedom of assembly as long as you stay within the lines, but if you express an unapproved view, then you go to jail, but that's freedom, isn't it? You do exactly what I tell you to do or else I imprison you. Is that the freedom that you recognize? No, that's insane. And so that irritated me and I said, well, but don't you think as a Christian leader, you should say something when Christian clergy are imprisoned for their views? No, and how dare you say that? And this person was joined by a chorus of people on the right. Yeah, shut up, shut up. National Review wrote a piece this morning. Shut up, it's bigoted to notice that Christian clergy are being imprisoned in Ukraine. And my view would be, you know, maybe you care, maybe you don't, but if you're a Christian leader and Christians are going to jail for their views, you are required to say something. Now, I am not a Bible scholar, but I'm pretty sure having read four out of four gospels that like Luke 17 doesn't call for shower cluster bombs on the children. In fact, I'm just gonna go out on a limb as a non-theologian and say the overriding message of the New Testament is bring peace. And this person with a straight face got almost weepy at the prospect that the government that's imprisoning Christians doesn't have enough missiles and tanks, which is, you know, maybe it's a you know, fair position. It's not a legitimate position for a self-described Christian leader to have. It's just not, I'm sorry, that's disgusting. And this person said to me, we need to do this because that's what leadership looks like. And I thought, you know, I've never been a diplomat. I'm the father of many children. And I, you know, I don't have a PhD in leadership, but I know what parental leadership looks like, paternal leadership looks like. And if two of your kids are in a brawl, maybe you think one's right and the other's wrong, but it doesn't matter. What do you say? Beat the crap out of him, he's wrong. No, you say dad's home. Knock it off. And the first thing you do, because you are in charge, not the children, you're in charge, your dad. The first thing you do is you stop the fighting. And then you take him into separate rooms and you administer whatever lesson or justice you think necessary. But they're not allowed to fight with each other because you're home, because you're leading your family. And there may be a way in which International leadership is totally different than managing a house of four kids and four dogs, but I don't know what that way is. If you're the leader, the last thing you do is sow more chaos. What dad shows up drunk and is like, keep hitting him! Bad dad! A man, in fact, unworthy of the name dad. That's not leadership. It's an abdication of leadership. It's a perversion of leadership and it's disgusting. And if I can just say, the foreign policy stuff, which if you grew up in this country, once again, as I did, you're not really used to thinking about because like it's literally oceans away. 
And they're like all these primitive people out there doing primitive things, tattooing their faces and being, you know what I mean? They're foreigners. So you're saying that it's in our national interest, vital national interest, to degrade the Russian military, in other words, to fight Russia with other people's soldiers. I would say, I would say it this way. If you think about the world order that we established after World War II, if you think about a rules-based system, where does a rules-based system come from? It comes from this nation, our Judeo-Christian foundation, that says that there are rules of the road, that there is something called absolute truth. And we established that. As a part of that absolute truth, what we're trying to do is make sure that our home front remains safe. Keeping our home front safe means that evaluating the actual threats to our country, the most immediate military threat that could happen is Russia. Why is a good question. You look at their sixth generation jets, you look at their hypersonic weapons, you look at their nuclear arsenal. Everything that we do that degrades the Russian military is good for America. You look at the long-term threat to our nation, it's China. Their existential threat that we face long-term becomes China. You look at this rising axis of evil that we're seeing being formed, it's Russia, China, and Iran. Breaking that to pieces before it gets started, I think, is in our vital interest. So on the day last February that Russia invaded eastern Ukraine. Russia and China were not allied, but within weeks of the sanctions that we applied and the stated intent of the Biden administration to effectively wage war with Russia, you saw an alignment which now hardened between Russia and China. The United States military cannot, as you know, since you oversee it as a member of the Senate, cannot actually defeat Russia and China united. Um, and so it would seem that the Biden policies have created a larger threat, no? Well, I would say it by looking back to 2014. There are two times that we've seen incursions in Ukraine that create peril for America. The first time was under President Obama when he drew that red line in Syria and nothing happened, which gave permission to Putin to come in and take Crimea. The second time we saw was when President Biden sat back and watched as Schultz and Germany led the Western Alliance to provide resources to Ukraine, which was a mistake colossal on our part. So what you saw was President Biden saying to Putin, I'm gonna give you a list of areas that we don't want you to have cyber attacks. Weakness. Second that we saw, President Biden said, gosh, you know what? If you just take parts of it, it's okay. Well, when, when, when we have NATO territory that's contiguous, bombs, missiles on our on NATO territory creates a real challenge for our nation. Well, you can see how life. it could become, you know, the third Absolutely. world war very quickly. So why not force a peace? How would you we do that? Do, well, you could tell Ukraine, and they are a client state of the United States, without American backing, there's kind of no Ukraine were literally paying the salaries of their bureaucrats. Um, we want you to sit down, as they tried to do, but were stopped by our government, um, and stop this war. Yeah. And, and reach a peace as, as one does, where both sides you know, concede some of their interests. Like, why wouldn't that be in our interest to do that? I think the faster we get to peace, the better off we are. What we don't want to do, from my perspective, is allow ourselves to ask for a premature peace that cannot be achieved as the alliances continue to come together. Uh, to the extent that we can find our path out of this situation, the better off we are. So what's the point at which we'll know that we've achieved our goal? Just, and, and I say that within the context of having watched 20 years of occupation in Afghanistan where nobody could answer the question, what's the point? Yes. And no one in Congress ever asked that question, amazingly. So what is the, what is the specific goal here? Yeah, so I would say that the objective should be for Zelensky and Ukraine to be able to achieve victory by maintaining as much of their territory as they possibly can and then seeing the resources that we've deployed along with our Western alliances, achieving the peace that I believe comes when you get these two folks to sit down and have a conversation that allows them to determine where those lines will be drawn for the next hundred years. Okay. Uh, where are you on, on the matter of sending cluster bombs? 
to the Ukrainian military? Well, if I was president of the United States, we wouldn't have to. Here's what you saw. But, but now that we have, what do you think of it? Well, I mean, I think they're, they're there. So here's what I would suggest is that... Well, they're not, I don't think they're there yet. Do well, you they, think that we should send them? I think that the mistake is when you have President Biden saying to the world that here are a host of weapons that we no longer have the ammunition to supply. You have a request coming from Ukraine saying we need more of the weapons that you say you don't have to, to, to provide. As opposed to keeping top secret information in your closet, you go to the front pages of every news station, you go to the screens and President Biden says to the world, we don't have the ammunition. And so what you see from Ukraine is, is they send the cluster bombs over. Under my administration, we would have the resources and a defense industrial complex that provides the weapons that we need and our Western allies need. We wouldn't be in this position at all. Do you think he should send them? I wouldn't have to. He already has agreed to do so. Huh. Um, l let me ask you a sort of non-Ukraine question. So I was just in Eastern Europe, much poorer than the United States. But one thing you notice in the cities I have visited there is that there aren't a lot of really any drug addicts living on the streets. ODing on the streets, the so-called homeless problem, which is a huge feature of life in this country, doesn't kind of exist or seem to exist there. What should we, what do you think of the fact that we've got hundreds of thousands of people living on the streets and dying there? What should we do about it specifically? In think? America? Yeah. Yeah, I think one of the things that we need to recognize is that we are in the midst of a mental health crisis as a nation. Yeah. If you think about the fact that there are several pieces of the puzzle that come together that we have not yet addressed. If you look back into the 1980s and early 90s, we had 600,000 additional hospital beds for mental health issues yeah. that we have today. So part of the crisis that we see manifesting in three major areas is a mental health crisis that we could help solve if we address the actual mental health crisis that underlies those issues. The first one is the fact that over 100,000 Americans have lost their lives to overdoses in the last 12 months. 70,000 Americans have lost their lives because of fentanyl. We could stop fentanyl from crossing over our southern border by closing our southern border. It would take $10 billion to finish the wall, and for an additional $5 billion, we could use the available technology to surveil, to surveil our southern border and our ports of entry to slow down fentanyl from coming into our country. This is a part of that mental health epidemic that we face. Second thing I'd say is that we always hear people talk about gun violence in this nation. No one actually takes a step back from the conversation about gun violence and ask yourself, what does it appear to be? 55% or so, over 50% of gun-related deaths are suicides. No one ever says that. That is a mental health crisis. And you add those two together and couple it with the reality that because of COVID, we locked our kids out of schools because the left is so committed to the teachers unions that they did the wrong thing for our kids. And what did we see as a result? A 30% plus increase of our youngsters going to the ER for mental health challenges. We need to get back to some honest bedrock truth that sets captives free. And the way that we do that is by focusing our attention on these three major issues that we need to address as a nation. Which begins with the very obvious question, why should I be mad at Russia? Like, why? Shut up! If the answer is shut up, or if the answer is to accuse you, an American citizen who loves your country, whose ancestors fought to defend it, of disloyalty to your country by people who care not at all about the United States. But if you're an American, like you don't think about it. And there is this sense in which foreign policy is like the one big thing that government does that's not subject to democratic, which is to say voter control. It's like, it really is about as patronizing as you can get. It really is, shh, men are talking. And that's really what they're saying. I'm sorry, you a foreign policy expert? Are you, what, what do you know? How many years did you spend in the diplomatic court? Did you go to Fletcher School? I don't think you did. Oh, well, it's my country, actually. 
and you're doing this in my name with my money and potentially my children. But that truth that democracy requires the public to sign off on wars is totally alien in Washington. And that's exactly why they like it. It's exactly why they like it. If you're trying to get some you know, trans rights bill through the Congress, like you couldn't get it through because people are watching and they should be and amen. And the democratic process works that way. Probably not gonna pass a bill in the United States Congress, even if Democrats control it, that says, you know, basically no more men's and women's bathrooms. We're all gonna be in one, one latrine together and we're gonna lick it. That's probably not gonna happen because nobody wants to defend that. But sending cluster bombs to a government that's imprisoning Christians and stealing the money, I think that's kind of not your business, America. And so they can collude and do it together. That's the truth. And the fact that Republicans have allowed this, and that even now, and again, even if you think we should be supporting Ukraine militarily, which is, I think, a legitimate, I don't share that view, but I think it's entirely legitimate. And I think there are a lot of awfully nice people who feel really bad for the Ukrainians. I actually feel really bad for the Ukrainians myself and think Russia shouldn't invade it. I agree with that. But it almost doesn't matter where you are on this question. If you can't have an adult conversation about it, which begins with the very obvious question, why should I be mad at Russia? Like, why? Shut up! If the answer is shut up, or if the answer is to accuse you, an American citizen who loves your country, whose ancestors fought to defend it, of disloyalty to your country by people who care not at all about the United States? It's too much. It's just too much. But what I will tell you, if you want to know what really, really matters to them and to you and to the future of the country, consider the things that you were not allowed to say. I noticed this right after January 6th. I'll never forget it as long as I live. As a very literal, not super quick, not highly clever person, I was completely content to believe January 6th was what it looked like to me on TV, which is a bunch of angry people who thought the election was stolen from them, who appropriately went to confront the people they thought stole it. So like George Floyd gets killed and all of a sudden they loot Foot Locker. What did Foot Locker have to do with it? I will say in Republican primary voters defense, they're mad at the Congress, they went to the Congress. They didn't loot any liquor stores, they just went right to the source. But anyway, so I saw this and I was like, yeah, okay, it was people super mad. They thought the election, I mean, this was January 6th, so like, it was, you know, it took a long time for me to figure out what happened, just being honest. I think I'm just too old, and so it's like hard to notice when things change, like certain assumptions you have, like, ah, of course it's on the level. They wouldn't actually like subvert an election. And as someone very smart said to me, really people kill each other over insurance claims. But I, I just kind of didn't think too much about it. Like I'm definitely opposed to vandalism. Anyone who breaks windows is not my friend. I hate that. Have you ever glazed a window, you ever put in a window? It's really hard. I mean it. If you don't think it's hard, try it. You get the size wrong, it doesn't fit, put little pins in, it's, it's ridiculous. It's like, a, it's like an all day affair to replace a divided glass door. Anyway, so I don't like that at all. And I said that, I don't like it. And within like about an hour, I heard people say, well, that was a racist insurrection. And I was like, really? I didn't, I didn't know race had anything to do with it. I didn't hear one person say a word about race and an insurrection, call me literal, is when armed people try to overthrow the government. That didn't seem to happen either. When, you know, the emotional devastation of this second 9-11 slash Pearl Harbor wears off, People calm down and come to their senses and you can have like a rational conversation. Trip West, I see you in the front row. Um, sorry, I just saw a friend of mine sitting right there. We can have like a rational conversation about what this actually was and why. And at a certain point, because I really believe in cause and effect, someone will say, well, why were these people so mad that, you know, none of them had criminal records. They were like grandmoms with diabetes and like a lot of debt. They're the least powerful people in our society, like legit the least powerful. And why were they so mad? Like, why did they take the bus from Tennessee to go jump up and down in front of the Capitol? Like something probably had better things to do. And then maybe if they think that the election wasn't fair, we will sit them down in a very calm, rational way and be like, I get it. We said that Biden won by 81 million votes. <laughs> this 15 million more than Barack Obama. It seems like a lot. Mm. Considering he didn't campaign and he can't talk. Um, <laughs> But you know, there was just something about him. It was that magic and 
you know, maybe you didn't feel it. It's like pistachio ice cream. It's not a flavor for everybody, but the people who like it really like it, 81 million. So settle down. And by the way, we have the source code in the voting machine software, and we've looked at it. And it's totally on the level. We've double checked. We wouldn't let like an electronic voting machine hide their software from us. Like never do that. And the Dropbox is like totally monitored by law enforcement. And every person who voted had to prove he was who he said he was with a government issued ID. Like settle down. And I would have said, fair enough. Because I want to believe in our elections. Who doesn't? And in fact, the people at the Capitol on January 6th are exactly the ones who most want to believe in our election. How many CNN anchors like deeply believe in the American political process? They put you in a camp if they could. Shut up. They have no interest in the process at all. But the people who really believed in it were naturally the most shocked and the most upset to believe it wasn't real. But anyway, I thought we would have that conversation at some point. You know, I never supported and I will never support vandalism, period. But I did think, well, maybe the upside this, Ashley Babbitt's killing, clearly in retrospect to murder, um, you know, it'll amount to something. We can have a national conversation about this. And I'm completely for national conversations. We never had any conversation about that. In fact, anyone who tried was deplatformed, debanked, basically hounded out of public life in America, bankrupted, in a lot of cases put in jail. We never, not only do we not have that conversation, that conversation was literally banned. Now it's in the guidelines of most of the big social media companies, you can't have that conversation. So I would just, I would make a couple of points. And the most obvious one is, any country that doesn't allow a free discussion of the process by which its leaders are elected is not a democracy, by definition. Free speech is a prerequisite to democracy. You can't have it without it. You can't have a dinner party without dinner. You can't have a democracy without free speech. So, there's that. So whatever you tell me, and by the way, isn't it, it's so interesting, and narcissists are this way, the projection involved. It's like whatever it is they're doing, and I mean at a precise level, is exactly what they accuse you of doing. You're attacking democracy. Really, I like democracy. Democracy would give people without money and without a TV show some voice in how they are governed. Therefore, I'm for it. And they want exactly the opposite. So the middle class in America, which has been not the majority since 2015, an anniversary that nobody noticed, has less economic power than it's ever had. And now it has less political power than it's ever had. So if you are taking power away from large segments of your population, you are by definition attacking democracy. That's exactly what you're doing. There's no other name for it. In the name of defending democracy, we took away the things we need to have democracy, which is our core freedoms guaranteed in the Bill of Rights. Just as in our war for democracy, we are supporting a government, paying for the entire government that has banned opposition parties, put opposition leaders in jail, shutting down free speech, now shutting down an election, and putting dissident priests in prison. It's such a democracy, they don't have elections anymore. That's how pure a democracy it is. But the second thing, and what's I think more applicable to this conversation, I learned, is that their response was the tell. If you wanna know what they care about, if you wanna know what's important, listen to how they respond when you say something unapproved about it. So if you were to, I don't know, write a post on Facebook tonight, and say, I think Papua New Guinea is the most powerful nation in the world. You would get not a single response other than someone's been smoking weed again. No one would care. It's like demonstrably untrue. That's why the flat earth people have been able to cruise beneath the radar for so long. But the point is, when something is clearly or very likely untrue, it poses no threat to anyone. What's scary and what will elicit a response are true things. No one is punished for lying. People are only punished for telling the truth. What are the crimes that are punished? Thought crimes. Thinking the wrong thing, having the wrong beliefs, saying unapproved words. And those words are always true.
But I am telling you that the people who censor your words and thoughts have a, this is one thing I'll say about them, they have a very precise and well-calibrated sense of what's important. They know. These are not frivolous people. They can smell like your dog can smell. Like your parents could smell in high school if you smoked a Marlboro. They know what's important. They don't waste any time in the unimportant stuff. And so I would honestly say a lot of the debates we have, and certainly a lot of the ones that I've engaged in, probably diversions from the things that really matter, honestly. And that may account for why every time I was out of the country last week and I came back and I was like, I've got a duty to be up on the news, read all these texts, and like everything I read is like a new height of insanity. I'm like, that's, uh, that, that is the Mount Everest of lunacy. You can't get any crazier than that at all. Breastfeeding men or whatever. You know, we're gonna, we're gonna give back Nebraska to an Indian tribe that no longer exists. We're not doing that, by the way. Omaha's safe, but I'm just saying. Every one of these stories enraged me. And of course, that was probably the point. I do think, I really believe that the exponential growth of totally irrational claims by the other side, things that no sane person could, I mean, beginning with men can give birth, but there are a million of them, that these claims are actually designed to take people like me and send us off into a screaming fit so we don't notice that actually they're looting the country. I don't think there's a single Democratic member of Congress who cares at all about trans rights. I don't think there's a single one who thinks men can breastfeed because like not one in history ever has. Quite a bit of evidence to the contrary on that claim. I don't think they believe it. I really don't. And by the way, it, it's super important to push back against them and to call them crazy because they are. I'm not saying a retreat from these things at all. I'm merely saying if they throw a story in your face that's so nuts that you can only growl like a dog in response, they're probably doing that on purpose. And you should probably look around and ask yourself, what are the topics that no one's even pushing back on? What are the topics that their response is so ferocious that people are like, I don't want to deal with it? One of them is the war in Ukraine. Another's COVID. And of course, the third is January 6th. And you have to ask, why is that? Well, it's not by accident, trust me. There is a reason. No one was more shocked than I was. Are you serious? In the Biden White House, somebody left an eight ball of cocaine in a public, I was like, I said to my wife, that just doesn't, it's just not in character, you know? I just don't believe it. So if I can just give you one piece of advice, after 27 years in the television business, don't trust a man with numb gums.